I'm really pleased to welcome everybody uh, to this very sunny uh, Saturday afternoon webinar, um, celebrating the life and work of the great physicist Marconi. Now, today is Marconi Day, uh, which is celebrated every year on the Saturday closest to Professor Marconi's birthday. Uh, he was born on the 25th of April, so his birthday is actually tomorrow. Um, but we have uh, all over the world this weekend, there are a whole series of events celebrating um, his life, his work and his legacy. So we are going to have uh, a really interesting this, uh, this afternoon. Please uh, post questions uh, if you would like to using the Q&A function. In, the, uh, in, the, in Zoom, uh, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to, ans uh, to ask, uh, everybody is invited to, uh, to contribute. So first of all, what I would like to do is to introduce myself. So I am Dr. Alexi Karanowska. Um, I am based at Magdalen College, where I actually am right now in Oxford. Uh, and I also have a group in the Department of Physics and I work actually on radio and microwave physics. Um, so uh, the work of Marconi is particularly close to my heart and also to uh, my activities in the lab. Now, we also have two very special guests, um, uh, Professor Livio Spinelli, who is- Good morning. <laughs> Good day. <laughs> so Professor Spinelli is joining us from Rome. I will actually just stop sharing my screen here so that you can see us all a little bit larger. Uh, so Professor Spinelli is joining us from Rome. Yes. Uh, where One moment, uh, my friend is coming. <laughs> we will. So uh, today is a very busy day uh, in uh, in Rome for Professor Spinelli because there are a whole series of events um, that have been uh, celebrating uh, Marconi and his legacy. So, uh, Livio, you have been in the Vatican, the Vatican this morning. Is that right? Yes. Yes. We have uh, <clears throat> since many years with Princess Aletra very good connection with the Vatican Radio. But today, this was a, a special uh, ceremony for the 19th uh, celebration of Radio Vatican made by Guglielmo Marconi. This was a, a very special event. And um, the <clears throat> relations of Marconi with the Vatican um, is not really known among the Marconi biographer. Uh, above all, the last seven years of the life of Marconi, almost uh, nobody knows about his researches uh, on microwaves uh, because his research center was uh, in Santa Marinella in my town nearby Rome. And unfortunately in 1944, his laboratories and uh, his Marconi Tower was destroyed by the Germans. But I, it happened to me to find uh, some uh, information, some details information in Santa Marinella, but also in London, uh, in some archives of the Marconi company. That's amazing. And so, so shall we? Uh, what I, what I, uh, I'm really excited to hear the story uh, of, of, um, of, of Marconi and, and microwaves, and in particular the, the connection to the Vatican. But I wonder whether we might just introduce our uh, our, our third panelist here this morning. So uh, Roger Michael, who is the uh, executive director of the Institute for Digital Archaeology, and is yeah. our man in America. Um, so uh, Roger, would you like to explain to the audience where you are right now? Yes, uh, hello, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Karanowska. I'm actually at Marconi Beach, uh, just a few miles from the wireless station where uh, the, that first transmission was made uh, in 1903 uh, between uh, President Roosevelt and, uh, and King Edward of England. Uh, that, that the first message uh, was something along the lines of, uh, I wish to extend on behalf of the American people most cordial greetings and best wishes to you and to all the people of Great Britain. So I'll I'll, I'll echo uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Roosevelt's sentiments and, and, and wish everyone in England today uh, a, a good day. Happy to be here on Marconi Day. Great to see uh, Professor Spinelli and, and, and you. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing to be at this spot because uh, there's something timeless about, about the coast, about the ocean, about the water. And it, it, it brings you right back to that day more than 100 years ago 
uh, when, when history was made here. It really was the day the world got smaller. You look at the vastness of the ocean and you think about the, the, the effect on people's sense of space and time that, that Mr. Marconi's extraordinary invention created. Suddenly you could whisper into a microphone in Wellfleet here and be heard uh, all the way over in Buckingham Palace. So it's a it's it's a it's an interesting contrast to, to be here and, and and great to be here with you both. So let's explore that a, a little bit further. So I think that one of the things that we would like to do today as part of this celebration is understand um, the, the the different dimensions of the contribution that uh, Professor Marconi made. So on the one hand, um, they were international. So these are these he changed the world in a way that was incredibly profound and very far reaching, um, you know, right the way across the globe. His inventions uh, had an enormous impact, but he also had a very particular local impact in certain places. And his story uh, is tied to the story of Wellsfleet, where um, Roger is right now. Uh, it's tied to the story of Rome and the Vatican, where uh, Professor Spinelli is now. And it's also tied to Oxford um, in some interesting and, um, and perhaps not so well-known ways. So I'm going to start, uh, sort of stimulate a little bit of conversation um, by, I'm going to sh share some slides here. So, um, so first of all, I want to, uh, to introduce a little bit uh, of the, the broad story. So uh, as Professor uh, Spinelli was explaining, uh, the, there are big celebrations today uh, in, in fact, all over the world, but in particular in, particular, uh, in, uh, in and around Rome, around the Vatican um, and around uh, uh, Santa Marinella. Now, uh, Professor Spinelli, um, Marconi had a, had a laboratory actually inside the Vatican or a, a, a radio laboratory right there. That's, that's right, isn't it? Well, uh, Marconi, uh, uh, the, the birth of microwaves uh, is uh, an amazing uh, is an amazing uh, story, because uh, in 1929 and in 1930, uh, there were already in Paris uh, meetings to buy and sell uh, frequencies, but on that time nobody was carrying uh, our microwaves. In 1930, Marconi <clears throat> wrote to the CEO of the Marconi company in London, informing him that he had decided to start studying microwaves uh, and uh, asked the CEO of his company to get some money to start the researches. And I read the answer of the CEO to Marconi. This was uh, something like a joke because the CEO write to him, dear sir, uh, dear Mr. Marconi, you know that microwaves are useless. Therefore, if you want to play with microwaves, uh, you have to use uh, your pocket money. So Marconi was president of the Italian National Research and he built up uh, some laboratories uh, nearby Rome uh, in the town of Santa Marinella, where I live. Uh, and uh, from the Marconi Tower, he started to try microwaves um, applied uh, to mobile phones uh, using uh, his car with an antenna on the back of the car and using uh, his uh, yacht, uh, the electric yacht, uh, moving along the coast uh, and uh, he was able in 1933 to build up uh, the first microwave link, tele telephone link between the Vatican town and the, uh, and the, and the palace of the Pope uh, in Castel Gandolfo. That's Connect remarkable. Yes, you, you you really think so? So uh, just to fill in a little bit of background for people, I think you know, we associate. Uh, Marconi with radio. I think everybody thinks of him as the, uh, you know, a, a, a pioneer uh, in the production of radio systems, which of course he was, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the background to that in a moment. But in fact, um, the, his, his contributions to physics stretch right the way forward into the microwave age. And as Professor Spinelli was explaining, this was someone who was building mobile phones in the 1930s. 
you know, uh, which is which is fairly fairly extraordinary. A full sixty years before that technology really became, uh, before you know, the time that we really think that technology was uh, was kind of in, invented. What we'll do, so I I will uh, I first of all want to um, highlight also a a, a, a very uh, special guest uh, who is with us uh, in spirit. Um, Principessa Electra Marconi, so uh, the great Marconi's uh, daughter. And um, I uh, am proud to be able to call Princess Electra uh, a great friend. And she is also a great friend of Oxford and Oxford physics. Um, so Electra has visited Oxford many times. Um, I think first with her father uh, when she was a child. Um, uh, Marconi collected a, uh, an honorary degree here in Oxford. Um, and more recently, uh, in connection with the uh, deposit, deposition of her father's archive, uh, there are many physical objects that now live at the History of Science Museum um, on Broad Street. And I would really encourage those of you who are local to, uh, to take a look there once the museum reopens on the 18th of May. And we will be having a special exhibition uh, about the life and work of Marconi, which we will say more about a little bit later on. Uh, and also there is a massive paper archive, uh, which is deposited in the Bodleian Library uh, in Oxford um, and contains an awful lot of really interesting information uh, about uh, Marconi's uh, connections to the United Kingdom, because in fact, uh, the development of uh, the Marconi company uh, is a story which is uh, perhaps surprisingly to some people very closely tied to uh, to the history of the UK, to the UK rather than uh, Italy. So one of the what I would like to do first of all actually is just to play a short message um, that uh, uh, Princess Marconi uh, recorded this morning. She's had a very busy day. Uh, so far, and will continue to have, I think, uh, with Professor Spinelli. Um, yeah. But I know that she wanted to greet um, the uh, the uh, everybody who is listening in from Oxford uh, on this special day. So I'll play that now before we go any further. Dear Professor Alexei Karinovska and dear friends in Oxford, you are celebrating my father, Guglielmo Marconi, and his experiment with microwave. Applied to mobile telephones, to radar, and to TV. TV. I wish to see you soon in Oxford and looking forward to see you very soon. Electra Marconi. That's wonderful. And you can see on the slide here, uh, so I, I wanted to uh, stress that Professor Marconi's passed on his uh, love of physics and enthusiasm for uh, technology to Princess Electra. And there is on the slide here, a photograph from a recent visit to Oxford Physics um, with Professor Radelli uh, in the Department of Physics. And we are touring um, a, a laboratory which is dedicated to the development of cutting edge instrumentation. And then another photograph uh, on the right hand side here, Princess Electra is a wonderful fan of the sea and sailing. Uh, and we had a very memorable trip uh, to Wellsfleet where Roger is right now uh, and we're able to fit in some sailing uh, a couple of years ago. That was a photograph that was taken uh, on that very memorable trip. So I want to say a few words just to return to the science for a moment um, about what radio actually is. Uh, it's a concept that I think we turn that we take for granted. We turn on the radio. Uh, now radio has become so ubiquitous uh, that it's you know we we often don't even stop to question what the what the radio is. But in the 19th century, some really important discoveries were made both uh, experimental discoveries and also sort of theoretical developments on which all of modern radio stands. So this was a very interesting century for the development of theory around radio physics. And um, there are a, a wonderful collection of characters that are part of this interesting story, um, arguably beginning with uh, Ersted, uh, was born in 1777. 
in the uh, in the 18th century, uh, and Ersted was the first to establish that if you had a current flowing through a piece of wire that produced a magnetic field, and these his discovery uh, and those that uh, that followed it closely, eventually led to the realization that there was such a thing as an electromagnetic wave. A radio is an electromagnetic wave. Obviously, it's invisible. We can't see radio waves, but if we could, they would look something a little bit like the diagram I've drawn in the in the center there. It's an oscillating magnetic field that travels at right angles to an oscillating electric field, electromagnetic wave. Um, and we owe the theory of electromagnetic waves to the great James Clerk Maxwell, a theorist. Um, and it was direct as a direct development of that work. Uh, so uh, Clerk Maxwell's life uh, came to an end as Marconi's life uh, began. Uh, it was almost uh, you know, a, 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 it was a transition both in terms of a generation, but also in terms of uh, the way that the work progressed. So Marconi's work sort of uh, stood on the shoulders, if you like, of these discoveries in the 19th century connected with uh, the concept of radio and the electromagnetic wave. Now, people might be familiar with the idea of the electromagnetic spectrum. So radio waves are electromagnetic waves. Everything on the electromagnetic spectrum is an electromagnetic wave. And different kinds of electromagnetic wave uh, are characterized or can be uh, sort of identified according to how long their wavelength is. So that is how far apart the peaks and the troughs of these traveling uh, waves are. And parts of the spectrum you will be very familiar with. So visible light is there right sort of uh, in the middle. Um, radio waves are down the long wavelength end of the spectrum. So they have uh, wavelengths peak to trough different dif distances that range from hundreds of meters uh, to, uh, to to meters. So this is uh, a the, the so-called radio band. Um, and then microwaves, as we've heard uh, Professor Spinelli and uh, Princess Electra uh, talk about, the microwaves are, if you like, the next set of electromagnetic waves up. So these are waves that have shorter wavelengths, um, and they are used in a whole range of interesting applications from um, microwave ovens to mobile phones to radar, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later. So. I think to get a flavor of how important Marconi's work is, it's helpful to sort of um, think about what wireless communication was like around 1900 when the young Marconi was working. Now, wired communication was already quite sophisticated by 1900. So people had, a, there was a telegraph system, which was international. So this was a system whereby uh, uh, electric signals traveled along a system of cables, just like uh, telephone cables, as we have, uh, that we, we still have uh, in uh, hanging around here today. Um, and there were stations that uh, transmitted coded messages along those telegraph lines. And that was that was quite sophisticated. But once you started to look at wireless communication, so when you needed to transmit a message in a context where it was not possible to attach a piece of wire to one end uh, and, and have you know, uh, somebody waiting at the other end with another piece of wire, things were not great. OK, so th this, there were a number of technologies that were available, but essentially, you know, they were they, they, they sort of boiled down to either taking a message physically or transmitting a message over a line of sight. So, you know, some examples would be you know, by horseback. So you could, of course, give a messenger a, a, a message. You could put him on a horse and you could send him off. Now, how fast could he go? He could probably go at 20 miles an hour. He could potentially travel an unlimited distance, but not on the same horse. So you'd have to swap horses if you wanted to keep going over a long distance. Um, and you were obviously limited by the, um, the, the, the geography in between. Okay, so if there's a mountain range or a, an, an ocean in between you and where you wanted the message, this was not a good technique. Another technique that was practical at the time, semaphore flags. With semaphore flags, the idea is that you have, you actually send a message uh, by encoding letters in patterns of flags. This is something that works uh, in across a, a line of sight. So you have to be able to see the person with the flags. Now, it's instantaneous effectively in the sense that you see the, the message as it's uh, as it's happening, but it's rather slow because the person has to do uh, the encoding with the flags. 
Um, so it's fine, but it has some, some drawbacks. And of course, there are there were also carrier pigeons. Now, I think sometimes people laugh a little bit about carrier pigeons. It sort of seems like a little bit of a joke, but actually carrier pigeons, homing pigeons, were a really serious technology. The homing pigeon is a remarkable bird. Um, it can travel at speeds of about 60 miles an hour. Uh, and uh, these homing pigeons were in use well into the 20th century as messengers, but their range was limited to a few hundred miles, um, and the routes that those pigeons take are limited because they, uh, the birds have to be trained to, tra to travel on a particular path. So then what happened, you know, at a time when we were, uh, when this was the sort of the state of the art in wireless communication, radio came along, and all of a sudden totally changed this situation. So all of a sudden you went from having these very limited technologies to having a technology that could, that could transmit messages at the speed of light over thousands of miles. So what does that mean? Well, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So that is 300,000 kilometers a second or 186,000 miles a second. It's remarkably fast. And this is the technology that Marconi brought to the world. So the question is, how did he do it? Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that, that Marconi innovated in so many different ways, made a huge contribution to every component of the radio system. So if you want to build a radio system, you need an encoder. So you need to be able to encode your message onto a radio wave. You need to be able to transmit the signal. So you've then got to transmit the radio wave over some distance and you need uh, to, to be able to do that reliably. You then need a receiver at the other end and you need a decoder. You need to be able to retranslate that signal uh, from the radio domain into uh, an audible domain or, or whatever uh, using, you know, into whatever medium you're able to use to read the message. And in all of these areas, encoding, transmission, reception and decoding, Marconi made a huge contribution um, at the turn of the, the 20th century. And he was a very, very skilled experimentalist. I don't know, Professor Spinelli, do you want to say a little bit about this? So he, he had a real knack for making practical things work. Yeah, um, he, was, um, um, he was amazing because on that time uh, in Italy, nobody trusted uh, this young boy uh, playing with wires <laughs> and uh, and rings uh, because uh, on that time he was living in a farm and there was no electricity therefore he had to go to <clears throat> to make uh, batteries by himself uh, and uh, almost uh, everybody in his family and his, um, the other families uh, thought that it it was a bit uh, a bit strange boy <laughs> and uh, he, he didn't care about this and he tried and tried uh, over and over again uh, with um, his with his brother and old and the old farmer and uh, trying and trying over and over again he was able to ring a bell from one room from his room to his mother's room and then always uh, make the distance uh, the distance longer he was uh, lucky because uh, on that time in italy nobody had any idea of uh, his uh, invention but his mother was uh, um, an irish woman and uh, uh, his mother appreciated his uh, his son experiments and uh, told him to go to London to her cousin that was engineer. And when he went to London, uh, he was uh, a very lucky person because he met uh, the postmaster of London that was trying to do the same experiments, but he was not successful. As soon as uh, he realized that the invention of Marconi was working, that was the first step for the birth of the radio. It's remarkable because I think it's important to realize that um, 
Marconi was working with radio waves at a time when there was a lot of skepticism. Yeah, so, yeah. So there were many people that were excited about the possibility of, uh, of transmitting signals, but the scientific establishment had sort of um, ruled, if you like, come to, come to a sort of preliminary conclusion that it would not be possible to transmit radio waves over very significant distances, more than a few hundred meters. And there were some great, uh, there were some very powerful scientists who held that view. And so Marconi, who was really just a boy, I mean, um, when he came to London, he was uh, what he was, he was about 20. I think he had turned, uh, he'd, he'd, uh, he'd left his teenage years behind just, I think. Is that, is that right, Livio? Yes, yeah. um, I, I, I told you that uh, he was uh, a, clever, a clever man, a clever young man, but it was very lucky because in London uh, he met uh, several, uh, several people that uh, could be helpful uh, to help him to, to develop uh, his, uh, his invention. You know, in uh, 1888, uh, um, the, Royal, the Royal Navy invited him to, um, for the first time, to organize the radio communication of the home fleet. On that time, the Royal Navy home fleet was the powerful uh, uh, royal, uh, the, the powerful navy of the world. After these uh, Marconi transmissions, the day after in London, uh, there were newspapers that says, uh, shame, it's a shame because the communication of the um, Royal Navy in the hand of an Italian. And uh, Admiral Jackson replied to the newspapers, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, any <laughs> British Marconi. <laughs> Dr. Karanowska, can I jump in for a second here? Of course. You know, it, it's an interesting uh, thing to talk about the resistance of the scientific community to innovation. Uh, folks have to understand that around the turn of the 20th century, so many things were changing so quickly that it, it made people nervous. And I think folks can yeah. identify with that in their lives today as, as we're living through a, a technology revolution. Uh, and, and, and sometimes people feel uncomfortable with the pace of change. What's interesting is that, for example, aviation. Uh, around the turn of the century, uh, the uh, folks like the Wright brothers and in, in the UK, folks like uh, Sam Cody and J.W. Dunn, who were trying to create fixed-wing aircraft, were facing tremendous resistance from the, from the scientific and industrial communities. People thought balloons was the answer. Nobody thought that, that anybody would be able to create a reliable fixed-wing aircraft that would have military applications and commercial applications. But of course, within a few years, uh, planes were filling the skies. What, I, what I'd also like to say is she spent a lot of time, as of course you should and need to, discussing uh, the, the, the scientific uh, and experimental attributes of Marconi uh, that, that, that contributed so mightily to his success. I was having a chat with... Uh, it was great to have Princess Electra on the hear her voice. We have had so many wonderful adventures with her over the years. Uh, but I, I spoke th this morning and I had dinner last night with, with President uh, Roosevelt's grandson, Tweed Roosevelt. And we had a memorable meeting in Boston of Electra and Tweed a couple of years ago, which was great to see those two get together. Uh, but I asked, uh, I asked uh, uh, Tweed if he had thoughts about his, his grandfather's impressions of Marconi. And he said, of course, he was impressed by, by Marconi's prodigious intellect. But Roosevelt was a man who appreciated education and, 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 uh, and scientific uh, accomplishment as much as anyone. He read two or three books a day during his entire life until the day he died. He died with a book in his hands. The, uh, but what, what, what he said to me was that he had a special affection for both Thomas Edison and, and, and Professor Marconi, because in addition to their scientific accomplishments, they were also men who knew how to turn theory into practical uh, uh, objects, practical devices that, that, that would change people's everyday lives. They were men of action, like, like Roosevelt himself. It wasn't just, they didn't just exist in the world of the mind, they also existed in the world of commerce, uh, and they made things happen with the things that they, uh, that they invented. And I'll, I'll just close by saying that, and I don't, I don't think it's, it's, I've never seen it discussed before, but uh, one of the most important uh, public policy moments in the 20th century in America, and of course America was a great engine of innovation throughout the 20th century, 
centered on Professor Marconi's invention. Uh, it was a, there's a very, very famous uh, Supreme Court decision here in the United States. And that the question was whether a shipping line could be deemed negligent for not incorporating Professor Marconi's wireless technology into their boats. There had been a terrible accident, all hands lost. And, and the question was, first, would, would a radio on the ship have, have potentially saved those lives? The answer to that question was easy. Yes, it would have. Uh, and what, what the Supreme Court then went on to hold was that the shipping company could be held liable for those deaths because they had failed to incorporate that technology, that new technology, into their ships. And so suddenly, and of course this applied to every sphere of, of, of commerce and industry in the United States, so suddenly corporations had this huge incentive to incorporate new technology like the wireless technology, and it, and it fueled a pace of change like the world has never seen before, and it all came from... Uh, from, from Professor Malconi and his, his wireless invention, which puts me in mind of Electra's comment to us uh, many years ago that the, the, the impulse to create radio uh, in the very early days uh, was because Professor Malconi had a dear friend in the Merchant Marine with whom he could not stay in, in constant contact when he, was, when he was at sea, and he longed for an opportunity, a means to, to, to stay in contact with his friend. So it's, 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 it's I think Marconi... I, I, I guess to sum it up, I think Marconi was important not just because he represented scientific accomplishment, but also he had an entrepreneurial instinct that enabled him to translate in a way that for, you mentioned Maxwell and Ersted. I mean, Hertz was it was a was a was a, was a person on whose shoulders uh, uh, Marconi stood as well, and, and Hertz seldom found practical applications for the things that he did in comparison to Marconi, who changed the world with his ideas. So I think. It's a great for people listening today, especially young people who may have, have good ideas. It's always important to think about how those ideas can translate into, in, into something people in the, in the real world can appreciate, something that will help them save lives, change lives. So anyway, Marconi stands for, for a lot more than simply scientific accomplishment. He stands for being able to take scientific achievement and translate it into, into real world accomplishments. Yeah, no, thank you, Roger. Yeah, I think that that relationship between science and social change uh, is absolutely embodied by Marconi uh, in a very special way. It, it's hard to think of a scientist whose work is so closely connected to such an enormous shift, not just in, you know, we can talk about technologies that change things uh, practically in our world. You know, the hard disk is, a, is a, uh, a modern example of that, I suppose. It's changed our lives dramatically, you know, in the way that we use technology in our homes. But in terms of social change, one can't compare uh, you know, an invention like that uh, with the invention of radio. I mean, this was something, Roger, as you say, that just, uh, that changed, uh, created a shift in, in, in consciousness of a very uh, profound uh, variety. I want to come back to uh, the, um, the relationship between Roosevelt and, um, and, and Marconi and, and, uh, and Edward VII. I'll say just, uh, just to sort of um, give people a little bit of a feel for the technologies we were, uh, so as Professor Spinelli was, was outlining so nicely, uh, you know, this was a, uh, Marconi was, a, was an experimentalist, as, as Roger was saying, he was a very practical man. Yeah, um, he built true. things in his attic. Uh, he did a very good job. Um, and he was not afraid to persevere. He really felt that he could believe that he believed that his kit could work. And that is a really crucial um, quality as an experimentalist. I'm an experimentalist. Uh, it's important to, to have some grit, okay? Things never work first time around, but having some self-belief um, and, uh, and really pushing an idea uh, is, is a really important kind of quality to have. Um, there are some of, some of uh, Professor Marconi's uh, pieces of equipment um, are on display in the History of Science Museum in Oxford. There's a couple of examples here. Um, you can find more online and we'll give you a little bit um, of information about how to do that uh, after the, at the end of the talk. Uh, this is a receiver on the left here and uh, a really nice parabolic antenna, curved antenna uh, on the right. I wanted to say a little bit about, to sort of uh, get us in, in, in to, to kind of understand, you know, what this early radio would have been like. I just wanted to say a little bit about um, the, uh, you know, how this, how this kit was used. So we've said that Marconi was good at making equipment, was one of his, his big uh, talents, but, you know, how was it used? Well, the first radio messages were sent uh, by Morse code. Uh, so uh, just like telegraph messages, what would happen is you would write the message out, convert it into Morse code, and then transmit it as a series of dots and dashes. And 
um, the original radio transmitters were so-called spark gap transmitters. So they transmitted radio, radio waves by making an electrical discharge happen um, across two contacts. So uh, I, I've got some audio for you. This is this is what it sounded like um, when this was happening. Um, and in the, la the large radio transmission uh, stations that use this technique would have been very, very noisy places. It, it said that uh, when the transmitter where Roger is right now was in operation, it was possible to hear uh, the transmissions, the, the electrical discharge associated with the transmissions four miles away. So huge electrical voltages uh, involved, and this was a pretty exciting and actually very dangerous um, activity. So this is actually audio from a reconstructed transmitter um, that was put together uh, in, this is a, a, a sort of turn of the century era transmitter. Have a listen. This is the kind of uh, noise you would expect to hear. So that's a that's a Morse code message, um, and that noise would have been extremely loud from the the big transmitting uh, stations. And I'll come back actually to that point in just one moment with some with some great photographs. I want um, this 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 slide I think fits nicely actually with the comment that Rogers just made. Um, that this is the citation for for Marconi's Nobel Prize in 1909, which he shared with Ferdinand Braun, who was another great innovator in the area uh, of radio, developed some of Marconi's ideas. Um, so this is this is the citation from the Swedish Academy of Science uh, of Science, and I won't read all of this out, but you can see that the, the, there's a huge stress on this citation on the practical application of this technology. So in and the very short space of time between the beginning of his experiment, so it says Marconi's first experiment to transmit a signal by the means of Hertzian waves was carried out in 1895. During the 14 years that have elapsed, and he goes on, today electrical waves are dispatched between the old and the new world, all the larger ocean going steamers, have their own wireless telegraphy equipment on board and every navy, every navy of significance uses a system of wireless telegraphy. So in just 14 years, this young entrepreneurial uh, chap who'd been working in his parents' attic created this international phenomenon. And he saved many, many lives. So actually the, uh, the, the, the installation uh, of, uh, of, of radio systems uh, on ships um, across the world's navy, uh, quickly established itself as a technology that was uh, of enormous value when it came to preserving life when uh, ships uh, were um, were in danger, in peril. Now, I, I want to, building on the sort of slightly nautical theme, to show a couple of photographs in connection with this idea of going transatlantic. So this is uh, the, the dogs that are walking behind uh, Roger right now uh, are in the shadow of the, um, the, the wireless telegraph station that was built in Wellsfleet uh, in, um, uh, on the, the east coast of the United States. Uh, and this was the transmission station that was used in that famous uh, 1903 transmission between Edward VII and uh, President Roosevelt, uh, which established uh, the viability of, uh, of two-way transatlantic transmission of messages. People had before, or Marconi had prior to that date, sent messages like an individual let letter, for example, one way. But on that special day, the 19th of January, 1903, this, uh, this iconic message was, was sent. So here is a picture of Professor Marconi and his telegraph station. Those are the huge radio antennas which were built on this very exposed area of the east coast um, and on the right hand side there is the capacitor bank that was used uh, at the at the transmission station and you can see at the top that there is a a, a gentleman sitting on some scaffolding uh, above the above the technology there this was a very extraordinary electrical installation um, and the so here 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 were the messages that were sent um so uh president roosevelt 
uh, sent the message in taking advantage of the wonderful triumph of scientific research and ingenuity which has been achieved in perfecting a system of wireless telegraphy. I extend on behalf of the American people most cordial greetings and good wishes to you and all the people of the British Empire. Um, and then later that day, His Majesty King Edward VII, who was uh, also a great supporter of, of, uh, of Marconi's work. So all three of these great men were actually on very friendly terms. Marconi, uh, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt and uh, Edward VII. I thank you most sincerely for this kind message, which I've just received from you through Marconi's tele transatlantic wireless telegraphy. Um, so and there is a picture here from one of the local newspapers, uh, full page. Uh, showing the um, the, uh, the or recording this um, this momentous occasion. Dr. Karanowska, just a couple of quick things. One is you, you show you showed that extraordinary installation, which sits just a few miles down down the road here. And as you say, when it was at full tilt, not only could you hear it, but according to, to contemporaneous reports, you could actually feel it. It would raise the hairs on your neck. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Tesla would have been would have been proud. Yeah, uh, but what, proud. I, what, I, what I wanted to say is just a couple of years earlier, in 1901, uh, Marconi stood uh, in Newfoundland with a kite in the sky from which an, an antenna trailed and was able to pick up radio transmissions from, from, from Europe, proving the idea, the concept, the basic concept that, that these transmissions could be detected across the Atlantic. And I love the, the, the juxtaposition there. Benjamin Franklin with his kite uh, just uh, uh, discovering or, or at least understanding in his own way the basic principles of electricity and then suddenly flash forward. You know, I, it seems like a long time from where I'm sitting, but it really wasn't. It was 150 years. Uh, flash forward to Marconi standing on the beach in Newfoundland with his with his kite, making the realization that this was a, this was a possibility. But what I'll also say is you showed that newspaper headline. And, and one thing that we haven't talked about, we've talked about the where, where Marconi stands in the in the in the in the in the, uh, the, the family tree of, of radio uh, physics in, in the 20th century, where his where his achievements lie in that in that continuum of of of, of, of innovation, uh, which is of course what we're all about today. But I think it's also appropriate to remember, especially as we discuss figures like like Roosevelt, who were intimately involved with this, that one of the other things that, that Mr. Marconi's invention did was it changed the political life forever. The change it changed the world of politics forever. And had it not been for uh, mass communication, instantaneous mass communication that Mr. Marconi made possible, those great speeches by Churchill and by Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who became president during World War II, uh, had they not been able to, to, to communicate in that way to millions and millions of people, the, the course of world history would have been changed. It was the inspiration that those men provided in those radio transmissions that galvanized public opinion around 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 the issues that that that, that World War II uh, uh, focused on. So I think I, and and Roosevelt was 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 absolutely Teddy Roosevelt, who stood with him in, on Wellfleet, where I am today, was absolutely aware of this. He was he was the first president who used the power of mass media in those days. It was it was telegraphy uh, to political advantage, and he saw immediately what the advantage the political opportunities were in Mr. Marconi's invention. And indeed, uh, it, he, was, he was proven correct by the events that transpired thereafter. So I think it, it's, it's when we think about how Marconi changed the world, it's not just the, the, the technical innovation. Certainly, that would have been enough. Had he only accomplished that, had he only provided the, saved all of the, the, the millions of lives around the world that radio, uh, that radio transmissions have, have saved, that would have been enough. But uh, what he did in terms of changing the way people communicate and the way that, that mass communications has, has, has shaped political thought in the 20th century, I would suggest that's, that's an accomplishment of co-equal importance. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's really, 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 really thought provoking. Thank you so much, Roger. So I want just in the last few minutes to uh, just to, to say a little bit as well about um, Marconi's contributions to other areas of physics, and in particular to microwave physics and radar, uh, as Professor Spinelli has already actually enlightened us a little bit in the context of our, uh, our earlier discussions. So um, radar, um, which stands for uh, radio detection and ranging, um, is a technology that people have probably heard of. We hear about radar systems uh, used at sea, radar systems used uh, in the context of air traffic control in the air. Radar um, is a technology which uh, was developed relatively recently, so during um, beginning around about 19, 1930. And this is a technology that uh, Marconi 
uh, and the company he founded had a huge role in developing, both in its early stages, so the early radar used radio waves, uh, so similar kind of uh, so high frequency radio waves, and then um, as the technology became more developed, uh, radar systems started to use microwaves uh, and that making uh, that transition from radio wave low frequency radar to high frequency radar it was a very important one technologically um, and one that uh, Marconi uh, had a had a, a significant role in so there are a couple of pictures here that uh, actually Professor Spinelli might want to sort of say a little bit uh, around so the first is of a, uh, a, a on the left hand side here is uh, there's a little bit of local history here uh, for those of you local to Oxford, so this is a, a Morris Oxford, so Morris Motors based in Oxford in Cowley uh, Motor Works. Um, this is a Type T van and it's been modified by um, the, uh, the then Air Ministry actually to uh, have a prototype radar system um, inside it. And on the right hand side, you see part of the very important uh, radar system that started to be developed uh, beginning around about 1935. Is that right, Professor Spinelli, in, um, in, in the United Kingdom, the chain? Um, I know that um, in 1919, uh, Marconi held uh, an important conference in New York uh, with the Association of the Electrical Engineers. Uh, and he had uh, in that conference foreseen uh, the um, the radar the radar system. What I know is that after this conference, uh, he, um, he had no time to to go forward uh, this um, these researches. And when uh, in 1933 he inaugurated the, the first mobile uh, system between the Waddingham town and the <clears throat> and the palace of the Pope in Castel Gandolfo. Uh, during the day, at some hour in the afternoon, uh, they had uh, very, very strange noise uh, during the telephone uh, communication. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, uh, the, uh, he was not able to realize uh, why, uh, why they had such noises. Then, um, after doing some controls, they um, found that in the afternoon, between uh, 3 and 4 or 3 and 5 p.m., some gardener of the Vatican Gardens, uh, working uh, with a machine, uh, were passing through the beam of this uh, microwave telephone link. And he realized, uh, uh, this, is in, this is a document that I have, uh, I found in the Marconi archive, and he realizes uh, the detection, and he decided to begin to start again uh, experiments for the radar uh, localization. Um, what a great is, story. It's, it's, it, it was a gardener detector. <laughs> yes, this is, uh, this is an official document that, uh, from the Marconi archive that I found. And uh, I, this morning uh, when we had the batting and radio ceremony, I remember this, uh, this, <laughs> this event that, uh, from, from which the radar uh, was uh, at the, the birth. Yeah. And uh, um, there are, I have uh, a lot of um, documents uh, in, in my archive, and I'm a bit worried because I am the only one that to have all these special documents of Marconian information. And if my computer broke or my archive broke, <laughs> it will be a great loss. Therefore, I'm trying all over the world to publish and to give everybody news and information about this, uh, these researches. You know, nobody knows, almost nobody knows, uh, even the BBC journalists in Rome, uh, that Marconi was uh, uh, the first, was 
the, the Marconi company gave birth to the BBC TV. You know, I told, uh, I told you yesterday during a telephone call uh, because uh, the BBC at the beginning uh, um, didn't trust the Marconi, uh, the, the Marconi system. Uh, and uh, they begin to try the mechanical system. Then in, 1930, in 1934, the Marconi company and the EMI company merged in uh, one or in one new company, the Marconi MI uh, TV system. The president of this new company was Marconi and they were able to build a, in 1934, the first electronics uh, the video camera for TV uh, that they called the high definition TV because they had this uh, high definition at the 405 lines interlaced. For the first time, the official BBC transmission began in November 1936, and they tried both systems, the mechanical system and the electronic systems. After one month, they decided that uh, the to take the to use the Marconi electronic system and this this Marconi system this high uh, let me see this high definition system was on duty until 1978 used by the Scottish BBC TV and uh, I went uh, I went to London I had a meeting with the vice president of the BBC and he gave me many detailed information. Marconi was a war of the researches of Enrico Fermi in Rome. Um, and uh, in 1928, Marconi was the, the first, uh, uh, as president of the Italian Research Center, he organized the first nuclear uh, scientist world meeting in Rome. And uh, he was uh, the president of the Italian Research Center and he was financing the research of uh, uh, Enrico Fermi. This famous nuclear physics conference, uh, for those of you who are interested in that uh, sort of era in the development of science, that was a quite extraordinary meeting. Uh, everybody was there. And uh, we will post some pictures, actually, that were taken at that conference. There's a very famous picture of everybody lined up. Um, and that was, you know, it was an important moment for physics, actually, again, yeah. uh, and one which is not necessarily generally connected with Marconi, but he was there in the background sort of making all of that, all of that happen. I wanted to say just briefly, I know that we're, we're sort of running short on time, but linked to the microwave, uh, there's linked to the, the radar uh, physics is microwave physics as we've, we've talked about. Marconi made a huge contribution to the development of practical microwave uh, technology. And there's some local history here, which is quite important. So during the, uh, the Second World War, uh, the physicists, many of the physicists, in particular the spectroscopists, uh, who were working here in the Clarendon Laboratory in Oxford, just up the road from where I am, were seconded to work for the Admiralty on the development of three centimeter radar systems. These were systems that were relatively high frequency at the time and came to be a, a very, very important technology uh, uh, during the, you know, the, the so-called battle for the skies during World War II. So these were systems that were able to be used um, on board airplanes, um, and were able to be used also on the ground to detect uh, aircraft, understand where they are in the sky. There are a number of local characters who are part of this story who were very important. So one of them was Professor Lindemann, who was Churchill's chief scientific advisor uh, and also head of the lab here uh, in, in Oxford. Um, in fact, the Lindemann building uh, is named after Professor Lindemann. Another important character who may be a little less well known uh, was Henry Tizard, 
and this picture actually was taken uh, in 1940. This is Henry Tizard in the middle, uh, and the two people to, to his uh, left and right are actually at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, just up the road from uh, where Roger is right now. And this was an important visit of Tizard from, uh, from the UK. He brought some scientists over from, uh, from Britain to the United States during the war. <laughs> of a huge uh, scientific collaboration between the United States and Britain during the Second World War. And through that collaboration, a remarkable number of, uh, of, of technologies were developed, not just radar, but uh, a, a range of other uh, interesting developments. But it was also part of an important uh, scientific diplomatic link between the UK and the United States. It was also actually absolutely instrumental in MIT, which people may have heard of, a very important science institution in the in the United States, becoming the institution that it is. So the public funding uh, to support MIT was very closely linked to this important uh, part of um, Anglo-American um, uh, political and scientific history. And the technology that really took Mr. Tizard over to the United States um, was the microwave, was that microwave technology. So the development of, he's actually standing by something called a magnetron, which is a, uh, a device that's used for producing microwaves. And the legacy, this, you know, this is all um, very closely related. Uh, building on uh, the work of, um, of uh, Professor Marconi. Uh, it's actually interesting to say also, so, uh, you know, as Roger was mentioning earlier, um, you know, there are these, these characters that have very important roles in changing through science or had very important roles in changing through science in the social sphere as well as the purely scientific sphere. Henry Tizard is an example of such a character. He's actually most well known for his contributions to um, aviation history. So he was someone who was very much behind the developments of, uh, of aviation technology. Um, and he's also, uh, he was also very important in the, the history of fuels. Um, so he, he knew an awful lot about the chemistry of, uh, of, of, of uh, high performance fuels. And he was uh, briefly, so he was based in Oxford um, for part of his career. And he was actually uh, for a number of years president of Magdalen College, where I am right now. Um, so as I say, uh, a little bit of um, a little bit of international. With, with, with I mean, Dr. Karanofsky, I, I'll just say very, very quickly that you, you raised an incredibly important point. People to this day talk about the special relationship, the special diplomatic and political relationship between the UK and the US. And there are many threads that, that bind us together, especially World War II. But I think the, 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 the narrative that you're tracing out here, beginning to trace out here of the, the intertwining of, 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 of technical innovation and, and, the, and, 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 and the relationships between the innovators behind it, uh, was as big, uh, uh, played as big a role as anything in, in creating that special relationship over time. The only other point I'll add to what you said, and, and this is something that I know we will uh, uh, focus on in, in the exhibition at the History of Science Museum to come, uh, but you mentioned the early warning radar system and, and talked about its role in the Battle of Britain. I, you, can't, you can't emphasize enough the extent to which Marconi uh, played a dispositive role in the, in, the, in the outcome of World War II. Were it not for those 11 minutes of early warning that, that, that those radar stations provided in terms of first contact via radar and then overflight of London, it is, it's incalculable how many additional lives would have been lost because all of those attacks then would have been surprise attacks, no time to get to uh, uh, safe places uh, to, to bomb shelters. It, it, this is a massive contribution for which Marconi has received very, very little credit. I think you could make the case that, that, that Marconi given the timing of things and given those tenuous years during the Battle of Britain when before the U.S. entered the war, had it not been for Marconi, public opinion very easily could have shifted against the uh, against Churchill's approach to that, to that war and, and the outcome could have been very, very different. So Marconi played a huge role and I think that's something that, that'll be very interesting to explore in the, in the, in the, in the yeah, time. And, so, and scientists generally, I think that there was, you know, people sometimes underestimate the, uh, the power and the influence of some of these very courageous individuals. Marconi was one of them, Tizard was another, who really, you know, put their necks on the line during a very, you know, this was, the, you know, these were countries in crisis. Uh, you know, we were, there was a war happening uh, and uh, and there, are, there were many great, uh, many great men actually uh, sitting at this interface between politics, science, uh, that have had a huge impact on, on the history of our island uh, and of, um, 
the United States, of every other country in the world, actually. So um, I want to also just quickly make the link and talk a little bit. So, so you know, I, I mentioned early on that I myself am a microwave physicist. Um, you know, none of my work would be possible without uh, these early innovations in radio and microwave physics that were driven by uh, Professor Marconi. Um, I will point out that in this picture here, so this is a picture of my lab, um, where we do experiments on the circuits that are on the right hand side of the slide there. Uh, these are little tiny little electronic circuits that are made from superconducting materials, where we look at uh, microwave physics um, in minute detail. So we do experiments that are um, with very tiny signals. Uh, in systems that are cooled to a few thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. So that piece of equipment on the right of the photograph, there is something called a dilution refrigerator, which cools uh, systems down to these very, very low temperatures. And then you can see the instrument bank on the left hand side here. Uh, most of the pieces of kit in that instrument bank are microwave sources. These are uh, the generators that allow us to, uh, to insert signals into um, the into, into our scientific equipment and those that aren't sources are detectors. So therefore receiving uh, these, these tiny signals and none of this technology would have been possible uh, without, they say, the, the developments that we've been talking about uh, this, this, this afternoon. So um, I want to uh, end with a little bit of an advertisement. Uh, so this is uh, the Marconi van. Uh, so we talked a little bit about Morris Motors um, uh, a moment ago. Uh, this is another Morris Motors vehicle. Uh, he was built in Oxford in 1968. Um, it's a Morris Minor Traveller 1000. Um, and we are installing into the back of this little van a wonderful exhibition uh, about Professor Marconi and his physics. Um, and this will be on display in front of the History of Science Museum uh, once the museum reopens again on the 18th of May. So you'll be able to come along um, and uh, learn a bit more about Marconi, about radio waves, about microwaves um, and, uh, and that physics. Uh, Professor Spinelli, did you, want to, did you want to jump in there? Well, I, I want to introduce my friend, uh, uh, Mariano Mezzetti. He's uh, the president of the Italian uh, amateur, radio amateur and the um, section uh, of Civita Vecchia. This was uh, a very loved place uh, by Marconi and uh, he's president of the only club in the world which uh, has a Marconi dedication to the to a radio amateur amateur club in um, 1927. In 1927. Uh, I have to thank him because uh, this morning he had an excellent he did an excellent job to organize uh, all the radio amateurs inside the Vatican area. <laughs> I like very much the picture of the car and. Um, I, um, I don't know exactly now if you have any idea to take this exhibition and this car uh, in, uh, in Italy, maybe, or uh, um, in other uh, European countries. Exactly. We would, we would love I to. Can, I can tell you that we, we absolutely do, Livio. So you will, you will see us uh, on the Via Condati, I promise, one day very soon. It, it would be a, a very, very good idea to take this. Uh, in the St. Peter's Square one day <laughs> and uh, with the, the help of the radio amateur to uh, air messages from the Vatican town and of course from uh, other Italian towns such as uh, the Marconi, um, where is the Casa di Marconi? The, the Villa, Villa Grifone, Villa Grifone. where uh, where the radio was was birthed. If people um, take a look at www.hsm.ox.ac.uk, take a look there, there will be updates on this exhibition. So I'm aware um, that time is ticking on uh, yeah. and Professor Spinelli, you have an afternoon of activities. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> to get back to but I want a very to, hard day yeah a long day so I'd like to thank everybody I'd like to thank you Professor Spinelli I'd like to thank your colleague thank you. it's been wonderful to meet you and I hope that we will uh, we will be see you again soon possibly in our Marconi van 
Um, I would like to, of course, uh, thank uh, Roger Michael as being our man in America. Uh, it's been wonderful and very atmospheric uh, to be uh, to be with you on the beach there today. Um, I'd a like real, to thank a, real a real pleasure, Dr. Karanowska. Thank you so much for organizing this, and uh, look forward to seeing you very soon. That wonderful. Hope to see you soon, uh, <laughs> Roger. I would also. I, I can't wait. <laughs> I would also like to um, like to thank uh, Princess Electra. Um, who, sure. as I say, I, I'm extremely grateful to for uh, for for being a part of our um, our journey, if you like, and understanding um, the uh, Marconi, his work, um, and his legacy. Um, and I'm so excited uh, about uh, being able to see her again soon, um, and for uh, for her to be involved in some of the events that we have uh, that we have coming up. Um, we've been apart for too long. Uh, it's very exciting to feel as though the world is starting to re-enter a state where it's safe to move around again. I'd also, of course, like to thank my colleagues um, in the Department of Physics, uh, my colleagues at Magdalen College, uh, who are part of uh, the uh, what, what will be a really ex uh, exciting uh, exhibition coming up, and of course uh, our colleagues at the History of Science Museum on Broad Street, who have been doing an enormous amount of work with us um, to, uh, to to pull all of this together uh, for the opening in May. Okay, so a wonderful afternoon to everyone, uh, a, a, a wonderful you. morning to you, Roger, uh, and to everyone uh, who is listening from the, the other side of the Atlantic, we'll be thinking of you, and uh, we hope to see you all uh, once again, um, both online and in person very soon. Thank you so much.